Hello everybody and thank you for joining today. My name is Michelle and during this presentation I'm going to be going over PARP inhibitors for metastatic castration resistant prostate cancer. I'm going to start out presenting some background information on prostate cancer and specifically metastatic castration resistant prostate cancer as well as a brief overview of treatment and some pathways that play a key role in this whole process. So prostate cancer is a cancer of the prostate, which is a small walnut-sized gland that produces seminal fluid in men. Prostate cancer is the most common cancer in men in the U.S. There's around a 1 in 8 lifetime risk of developing prostate cancer for males, and this accounts for about 29% of new cancer cases in men. The five-year relative survival rate for prostate cancer is around 97%, and that survival rate there is for all stages combined. And the most common type of prostate cancer is adenocarcinomas. More than 95% of prostate cancers are adenocarcinomas. Prostate cancer may be localized to the prostate area, or it may be more advanced disease. Advanced prostate cancer is classified into four different buckets, and those are listed to the right here in the graphic. So this recurrent or metastatic disease can be classified as biochemical recurrence, non-metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer, metastatic castration-sensitive prostate cancer, and metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer. So like I mentioned here, we're going to focus on this metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer bucket and one specific treatment option mainly for this type of cancer. Of note, when patients are metastatic, the most common metastatic sites are the bone, the distant lymph nodes, liver and thorax with the bone being significantly higher than all those other sites. Next I wanted to describe what we mean when we say castration resistant prostate cancer. So what this means is that the disease has progressed despite there being castrate serum levels of testosterone, so less than 15 anagrams per deciliter. The guidelines do say that if a patient has castration-resistant prostate cancer and confirm metastases with imaging, we should obtain a metastatic lesion biopsy along with some testing, the somatic testing for homologous recombination repair, microsatellite instability or mismatch repair deficiency, and tumor mutational burden. And these tests are important as they can help drive therapy choices as you'll see in the coming slides. For this presentation, we're mainly going to focus on the homologous recombination repair. So you might be wondering, what is the homologous recombination repair pathway and why is this important? So this specific pathway is a DNA repair pathway that's involved in fixing double-stranded DNA breaks. So it helps with cell survival. So if a patient has homologous recombination deficiency, that increases the dependence on PARP-mediated repair pathways because they aren't able to go through this homologous recombination repair pathway and have to for sure fall back on the PARP pathways. Without the PARP pathway working functionally, then there really is no way to fix the double-stranded DNA breaks or the DNA breaks if the homologous recombination repair pathway also doesn't work, and that leads to cell death. And I will show this more in-depth visually on the next slide with a photo. I wanted to also list some examples of these homologous recombination repair genes, which are shown to the right. The big one that I wanted to point out is BRCA1 and BRCA2, so you'll see that a lot and you'll see some specific drug FDA approvals just for that specific gene. As mentioned, I wanted to show the homologous recombination repair pathway as well as the PARP pathway and how PARP inhibition can affect this whole pathway and cell survival in a visual way. So you can see that here in the top left, it shows the DNA damage. And it shows that if PARP is able to bind to the damaged DNA, it's able to fix that single-stranded break and lead to cell survival. However, if you go down from that top left image, you can see that then a PARP inhibitor was used and PARP was inhibited. And then that leads to a double-stranded DNA break. And from there, it shows you what happens if a patient does have homologous recombination repair genes. 
And in that case, that double-stranded DNA break can be fixed and the DNA can be repaired, leading to cell survival. However, on the other hand, we have the cell with homologous recombination deficiency, and that one is unable to fix the cell and leads to cell death. Now that we understand the homologous recombination repair pathway better and the PARP pathway, I wanted to just briefly move into touching on treatment considerations for metastatic castration resistant prostate cancer. So the guidelines say for treatment for these patients to continue the androgen deprivation therapy, consider bone anti-resorption therapy with denosumab or zoledronic acid, potentially give palliative radiation if there's any painful bone metastases, also provide any best supportive care that we can, and then consider systemic treatment therapies based on tumor tests and previous treatment. Here's a screenshot of the full systemic therapy guideline recommendations per the NCCN guidelines for metastatic castration resistant prostate cancer, specifically adenocarcinoma. So I wanted to show you that there are a lot of options to choose from and it's based on, as I mentioned, previous treatment that they've had and their specific homologous recombination status, things like that. But I'm not going to touch on all of these treatment options in this presentation. I'm only going to focus on the PARP inhibitors. That's going to be the meat of our presentation. So those are highlighted here and I'll break them down in the next slide as well. So these are the PARP inhibitor regimens for metastatic castration resistant prostate cancer. The PARP inhibitors are bolded because there are some combination regimens as you can see. So we have two monotherapy options. We can choose either Olaparib or Rucaparib for monotherapy PARP inhibitor options or we have a few combination regimen options available. So those are Olaparib and Abiraterone and Prednisone or niraparib and abiraterone and prednisone, or lastly, talazoparib and emzalutamide as an option. Because each PARP inhibitor regimen has different specifics for their FDA approvals, I wanted to list a specific slide that showed each PARP inhibitor regimen and the specific FDA approval for metastatic castration resistant prostate cancer. So Olaparib monotherapy's approval is in homologous recombination repair mutations with patients who were previously treated with enzalutamide or abiraterone. Rucaparib monotherapy's approval is for patients with a BRCA mutation and patients who are post-androgen receptor-directed therapy plus taxane-based chemotherapy. For Olaparib or niraparib and abiraterone and prednisone, these patients' FDA approval was with a BRCA mutation. And then for talazoparib with enzalutamide, this FDA approval was for patients with just a homologous recombination repair mutation. Next, I wanted to touch on some trial data for each regimen that helped lead to their FDA approvals. So the first trial I wanted to discuss is called the PROFOUND trial. This trial studied population included patients with metastatic castration resistant prostate cancer who progressed after treatment with enzalutamide or abiraterone. And for the patient population, there was two separate cohorts. The first cohort or cohort A included patients with a BRCA1 or 2 mutation and patients with ATM mutations. And then the cohort B included patients with other homologous recombination repair mutations. And for this study, they looked at Olaparib 300 milligrams twice a day compared to enzalutamide or abiraterone. The results of the PROFOUND trial showed significant improvement with Olaparib versus investigators' choice in cohort A for progression-free survival, overall survival, and objective response rate. So for progression-free survival, there was a median of 7.4 months versus 3.6 months. For median overall survival, there was a difference of 19.1 months versus 14.7 months. And then for overall response rate, there was a difference of 33% versus 2%. There was also significant improvement for Olaparib compared to investigators' choice with progression-free survival in cohort A plus B with a median of 5.8 months versus 3.5 months. 
The next trial I wanted to talk about is the Triton 3 trial, and this trial focused on a population of patients with metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer who had a BRCA1 or 2 mutation or ATM mutation who progressed after androgen receptor-directed therapy, and this study specifically looked at rucaparib 600 milligrams twice daily compared to docetaxel, abiraterone, or enzalutamide. This trial showed that the duration of progression-free survival at 62 months was significantly longer in the rucaparib group than the control group. So in the BRCA subgroup, the median was 11.2 months versus 6.4 months. And then they also did an exploratory analysis of the ATM subgroup, but that didn't show really significant benefit. There was still, though, a, a little difference. The median progression-free survival was 8.1 months in the rucaparib group versus 6 6.8 months in the control group. The next study is called the PROPEL trial, and this study looked at patients with metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer, and this trial looked at first-line treatment of these patients. So it looked at elaparib 300 mg twice daily with abiraterone 1,000 mg daily and prednisone 5 mg twice daily compared to placebo plus abiraterone. And this trial found that there was a median overall survival of 41.1 months for the elaparib with abiraterone versus 34.7 months with placebo plus abiraterone. And then there was a median progression-free survival of 24.8 months versus 16.6 .6 months. This next trial I'm going to discuss is called the Magnitude Trial. This trial looked at first-line treatment of patients with metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer. The patient breakdown based off of homologous recombination repair status is listed here as well based off of whether they were negative, positive, and then of those positive, how many were BRCA mutated. This trial studied neuroparib 200 mg daily with abiraterone 1000 mg daily and prednisone 5 mg twice daily compared to placebo with abiraterone. The magnitude trial did show that there really wasn't any benefit in the progression-free survival in the homologous recombination repair negative group. The trial also showed that in the homologous recombination repair positive group, the median progression-free survival was significantly longer in the neuroparib and abiraterone group versus placebo plus abiraterone at 16.5 versus 13.7 months. They did also see that the median progression-free survival in the BRCA1 and 2 subgroup was significantly longer in the neuroparib and abiraterone group versus placebo and abiraterone at 16.6 .6 versus 10.9 months. The last trial I wanted to discuss today is called the TALAPRO2 trial, and this trial looked at first-line treatment of patients with metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer and also stratified patients based on their homologous recombination repair gene alteration status. The trial studied talazoprib 0.5 mg daily with enzalutamide 160 mg daily compared to placebo with enzalutamide. The median progression-free survival was not reached for the talazoprib with enzalutamide and was 21.9 months for placebo plus enzalutamide at the time of evaluation. The trial did see that there was greater benefit in the homologous recombination repair mutated cohort. In the last section of my presentation, I wanted to focus just on a PARP inhibitor overview. That includes brand generic naming, specific drug caveats like dosing, warnings and precautions, and adverse effects, and then costs of treatments. So listed on this slide, I have the brand and generic naming for each product. So we have Olaparib, which is Limparza, Rucaparib, which is Rubraca, Neraparib, which is Zajula, Talazoparib, which is Talzena, and then we have our Neraparib and Abiraterone combo pill, which is Akiga. Now I'm going to transition into discussing the specific medication and medication regimen caveats. So the first medication I'm going to discuss is Olaparib. This medication is dose 300 milligrams by mouth two times a day, and there are potential renal dose adjustment recommendations to reduce the dose to 200 milligrams twice a day if the creatinine clearance is 31 to 50 milliliters per minute. I also wanted to note this hasn't been studied in severe hepatic impairment or child P class C. 
There are some warnings and precautions with this medication that I wanted to pull out, particularly pulmonary toxicity and venous thromboembolism. Those are the main ones I wanted to pull out and patients with pulmonary toxicity risk or pulmonary toxicity or venous thromboembolism maybe wouldn't be the best candidate for using a lap rib. Other potential warnings and precautions are secondary malignancy and hypersensitivity reaction. Other common side effects of a lap rib, and those seen in greater than 10% of patients, are listed on this slide. Those are anemia, nausea, fatigue, anorexia, diarrhea, vomiting, constipation, back pain, peripheral edema, cough, and dyspnea. We also have the combination regimen, so Laparib plus Abiraterone and Prednisone. So I wanted to talk about the warnings and adverse effects that are added with that combination regimen to those already discussed. So adding Abiraterone and Prednisone adds additional warnings and adverse effects as shown on this slide. Those warnings are adrenal insufficiency and mineral corticoid excess, hepatotoxicity and bone marrow suppression, and then added adverse effects listed are hypertension, dizziness, and arthralgia. The next medication I wanted to discuss is Rucaparib. This medication is dosed 600 milligrams by mouth twice a day, and there are no renal or hepatic dose adjustment recommendations, but it is important to note this hasn't been studied in creatinine clearance less than 30 or child pew class C. The warnings and precautions of this medication that I wanted to pull out are just secondary malignancy. The common side effects of Rucaparib in more than 10% of patients are listed on this slide. Those are fatigue, nausea, anemia, anorexia, diarrhea, rash, constipation, vomiting, back pain, peripheral edema, arthralgia, dyspnea, dizziness, and headache. For the rash and itchy skin, it's important to tell patients to keep their skin moisturized with creams and lotions to decrease the risk. It's also important to mention to them to avoid being in heat for too long of periods and to avoid sun exposure directly. And then there are potential OTC antihistamines or steroids that could be recommended for management of this rash. Next, I wanted to discuss specific medication caveats of niraparib. So niraparib is dosed 200 milligrams by mouth once a day in combination with abiraterone and prednisone. And there are hepatic dose adjustments recommended for moderate hepatic impairment, so that's important to note. The warnings and precautions of this medication that I specifically wanted to pull out are posterior reversible encephalopathy syndrome, or PRESS, cardiovascular effects, bone marrow suppression, and secondary malignancy. The cardiovascular effects that are listed with this medication specifically are hypertension and hypertensive crisis. So again, may not be the best drug of choice for a patient with cardiovascular conditions. Other warnings of the specific combination regimen are adrenal insufficiency and mineral corticoid excess and hepatotoxicity. Common side effects in more than 10% of patients with the combination niraparib, abiraterone, and prednisone regimen are listed here. Those are anemia, hypertension, constipation, fatigue, nausea, thrombocytopenia, hypokalemia, dyspnea, back pain, anorexia, arthralgia, vomiting, and dizziness. The last medication I wanted to discuss is talazoparib. This medication is dosed 0.5 milligrams by mouth once a day in combination with enzalutamide. And it is important to note that this medication does have renal dose adjustments recommended for any creatinine clearance less than 60. There are also warnings and precautions associated with this regimen that I wanted to pull out. The main ones associated with the talazoparib are bone marrow suppression and secondary malignancy. And then other warnings and precautions with the combination regimen are hypersensitivity reaction, press, seizure, and falls or fracture, but those are more associated with the enzalutamide component. Common side effects seen in more than 10% of patients with the combination regimen are listed here again. Those are anemia, neutropenia, fatigue, thrombocytopenia, back pain, anorexia, nausea, constipation, fall, arthralgia, diarrhea, hypertension, dizziness, and hot flush.
To wrap up my presentation today, I wanted to show a medication adherence comparison chart. So I wanted to show the regimen, the pill burden, and the cost per 30-day period based on the average wholesale price online. So the first regimen is a lap rib, and for this, the patient would have to take two tablets two times a day, so that would be a total of four tablets per day, and that cost is around $19,600. Then we have Rucaparib, that would be again two tablets twice a day, so four total tablets. That cost would be around $20,800 per 30 day period. Next we have Alaparib, Abiraterone, and Prednisone. So for this, patients would have to take two tablets of Alaparib twice a day, two tablets of Abiraterone once a day, and one tablet of Prednisone twice a day. So that would equal eight tablets per day, and that would equal out to being $32,700 about. Then we have our Neraparib, Abiraterone, and Prednisone combo, which would be two tabs of the combo Neraparib, Abiraterone daily pill, and then one tab of Prednisone twice a day, which equals out to be about four total tabs per day, and about $22,530. And then lastly, we have our Talazoparib and Enzalutamide, which is one tablet of Talazoparib daily plus two tablets of Enzalutamide daily, and that would be three total tabs per day, equaling out to be about $38,846. So basically, our most expensive regimen here would be the talazoparib and enzalutamide, and the most pill burdensome regimen here would be the alaparib and adiraterone and prednisone. That concludes my presentation. Thank you all for listening, and please let me know if I can help address any questions. Listed here are a couple of my reference slides.